Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, February 10th. Our special guest today is Shelley Terrell. Her topic is Once Upon a Time, Teaching with Fairy Tales. Your co-moderators are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing closed captioning for us. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will now introduce Shelley and ask her the nitty question. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to all of you. Today, we are thrilled to welcome back Shelley Sanchez Carroll to inspire us with her fantastic ideas and resources for using fairy tales in the classroom. Shelley has been a faithful supporter of Classroom 2.0 Live for years, and we always love it when we get to learn from her in our shows. I've been a longtime fan of Shelley's regular Free Friday webinars on TESOL, and she always shares awesome tips and tools to support English language learners. I know many of you are fans of Shelley, too. Shelley is an international speaker, e-learning and digital learning specialist, and the author of several books for educators, Hacking Digital Learning Strategies, the 30 Goals Challenge for Teachers, the um, Learning to Go Lesson Ideas for Mobile Devices, Cell Phones, and BYOT. Shelley has trained teachers and taught learners in over 20 countries as an invited guest expert. She's been recognized for lots of awards, no surprise there. And recently, she was named Woman of the Year by the National Association of Professional Women. She received a BAMI Award as a founder of EdChat, and she was named as one of the 10 most influential people in EdTech by Tech and Learning. Her latest project is the creation of Ed Speakers, and that is a place where you can find speakers for your schools, and that has a way of enriching the field of education with truly passionate voices. There's some amazing speakers on there, and we'll be sharing that link in the live binder. And of course, her greatest joy is being the mother of an adorable little baby, Savannah Duncan Sanchez, and her dog, known around the world, Roscoe the Pug. So thank you so much for sharing with us today, Shelley. And to get things started, I'd like to have you answer a newbie question, and then you can go right ahead with your presentation. And our well, newbie question you. is... <laughs> what is a fairy tale? And what are some examples of a few well-known fairy tales? And now it's all yours, Shelley. Oh, thank you so much. That's an awesome introduction. And I love definitely um, the crew here of uh, Classroom uh, 2.0. You all do such an amazing job, and I really appreciate it. And I love being here as well. Thank you for everyone who's joining me. I hope to uh, teach you some good things about fairy tales, things you may have not known. Um, they're very, very interesting, and you can learn a lot, even as definitely as a young child, but also um, as adults. Um, fairy tales are always great to go back to and really look at the culture of it. So let's get to the newbie question. And before I answer the second part of the question, I want you to type um, different examples of what you believe are fairy tales because one of the things about fairy tales is um, that they grow, you definitely most people around the world have heard of fairy tales because fairy tales are basically their children's stories um, that parents share while um, that have fantasy creatures and also they have magic in them. They use, they pretty much all begin with once upon a time and not necessarily but the majority especially American fairy tales and with of course happily ever after. That isn't the uh, true in all uh, countries. Not all of them have a happily ever after especially in Japan. Um, but what's very, very interesting, and, and we can already um, begin, is that when you, uh, when 
the fairy tales first began, they began generations ago. And this is before there was even any publishing of fairy tales. So they were told and told for generations. And there was an important reason why fairy tales existed. They, um, and so we'll talk about that. But it's important um, to note that um, that even though these were told all over the world, different fairy tales, when they were published, it was very interesting that the majority of them were very similar. They had the same kind of fairy tales. So that's kind of just exciting in itself. You can find a lot of the history here. It's, the other very interesting part was um, the first fairy tales that were written, often I used to think it was Germany uh, because of the I, – I actually lived in Germany um, for quite a while. and about 30 minutes to 45 minutes a train ride was this uh, Mutchenland, which is the fairy tale uh, park. So um, definitely we have the, the Grimm brothers in, in Germany that made fairy tales very, very, very famous, including this one here. Um, but we do have tons and tons of fairy tales you're probably familiar with because of Disney. So you have Cinderella, Snow White, but you even have uh, different fairy tales that are, tend to be much shorter as well. You have Rumpelstiltskin. I mean, there's so many different types of fairy tales, even Little Red Riding Hood. So what's really fantastic, um, not only were, so the, the country that had, um, and you can try and guess inside the chat box, it was actually France. So it's the French fairy tales were the first ones that were um, collected and written down. And it's really interesting um, why fairy tales did exist. So remember, fairy tales existed before, you know, there was publishing and all of this. So if you think about it and you think about, even though the definition tends to be a children's story, um, why do you think that people told fairy tales? And of course, you know, the imagination element, um, you know, because it, it helps uh, children go to bed. But think if you were a parent way, way back with none of this technology, you probably um, were in the house all the time. The whole family was in the house. Um, you know, the children maybe went to school, but think of the type of culture and everything that you would have grown up in, like what your traditions would be like. And then you'll, oh, it'll make sense in a little bit why um, fairy tales came about. But it's important to note, too, that because they were shared from country to country to country, that's why they're such a great cultural teaching tool. And so you can actually compare fairy tales and the differences to begin to notice uh, different types of things from society. So the reason why fairy tales came about were because this was the way that parents were able to keep their children safe, teach them values, and very important lessons. And we're going to see the structure of a fairy tale and see how fairy tales actually help parents to prepare their children uh, to go out into the world and be adults. So when you think about the past, a lot of times you were the family unit, you were everybody that was in the neighborhood, and sometimes you lived, um, especially among forests, the houses, it wasn't like the neighbor was down the street. And so for parents, it was a very scary time. Um, they didn't have cell phones to geolocate their children or anything. And so a big problem was that children actually went to the woods, and the children would get lost, and they wouldn't find them. And so this was a huge problem. And so sometimes, um, so a lot of the fairy tales you'll see, they have this, um, this, this, um, this story or element of where there's a big bad wolf or something bad happens inside the forest. So this was a, a really good reason why they had fairy tales, to get their children to stay away from the forest so they wouldn't get lost in the dark. Um, but the other part of it as well was uh, 
if you look at fairy tales, and we'll see the structure in a little bit, you always see um, one of the elements that is part of a fairy tale is that the protagonist or the main character or characters will leave their home. And this was a, a huge uh, part of growing up. And a lot of families, um, you know, their children never left the home. The, the, and so it was going to be hard to tell them what they could expect in the world. So when you think of that there's an evil, there's a villain, and all of this, it's very practical um, that the parents would share all of this because they knew that their children were going to come across things that they didn't never come across in the world. And especially if the children were going to go to town and they had to trek and they had to walk and things like that. So it was very, very, very um, great to have fairy tales to really help um, the children learn these universal themes as well. So they started off as oral traditions. They did have a lot of folklore and myths. So if you come from, and Jackie Gerstein points out something really great. Hi, Jackie. She says, in New Mexico, parents scared their children to stay out of the arroyos by telling them the uh, La Llorona. And growing up, that was actually a fairy tale of mine. So it's a Latino history, and it's, it was a way for us to keep out of bad neighborhoods and things as well um, when I was growing up. It's funny because you'll see a lot of, um, especially with the um, Latino fairy tales, La Llorona is always in the most dangerous place when you're growing up. So for me, we actually have a place, and I grew up in San Antonio, and um, so we actually had this uh, river that um, that was dried up. Uh, it's a big ditch, and it was in, it's a really uh, bad part of the city that my father grew up in, and that's where they say La Llorona is. So it's really interesting because it does have those different um, types of depending where you're at. And so you may be interested after all of this discovering, you know, the different fairy tales of the world. And I definitely think that that's something your students should do is to compare different types of fairy tales. You know, that's a great way to learn about a country and fairy tales of the world can help you with that. You can um, find it by location or if you happen to know the authors, you can do that as well. Another interesting fact about fairy tales, and this I, I found out when I was um, in high school. I think my teacher had us, uh, and that's where I got the idea of teaching with fairy tales. So I've had my uh, high school students I used to teach, my elementary students I used to teach. Um, from two years old, I've had classes for two year olds all the way to, i say, 90. And so with all of them, we I've used fairy tales as an instructional tool. And it was interesting because my English teacher had us actually look at fairy tales. And one of the earliest lessons I remembered is looking at um, the Little Mermaid as told by um, a Japanese. Um, and it's interesting because fairy tales in Japan don't always end with a happily ever after. So um, the fairy tale, The Little Mermaid, ends quite differently in um, some of the Japanese versions. She actually turns into seaweed um, and doesn't live happily ever after. So it is interesting to compare the different stories. Um, and even in my own culture, um, La Llorona, this is definitely, when I was in Germany, I was in uh, the different castles and they had their own version of La Llorona. They had, um, and so it's interesting, I've been to different countries, and they all have this um, version of La Llorona, but it's not called La Llorona, it's something else. So when you compare the differences in the fairy tales, not only is um, it's good for students to search for the why, because there's such a huge part of society and culture, and they want to show things about, you know, that particular region even. And uh, Paula is talking about uh, Louisiana Rongarol. Is that uh, uh, Rong Rogoro? <laughs> is that better? <laughs> uh, Boogeyman and Prowls the Swamp. And so when students start looking at fairy tales much older, and they've been told these since they were two, three, four, and five, they might actually find it quite interesting that they're so scary, that they have actually very scary creatures like boogeymen. And, and that's all part of 
the culture um, that surrounds them and that they grow up with. So it it's great for them um, not only to compare the differences, but to also ask the why. Why do they have these particular uh, fantasy creatures in this fairy tale? Um, and then if they look, they'll be able to uh, realize that the different characters are actually, uh, you know, part of that culture and the belief. Now we actually, it was interesting because a few years ago, um, I was, we used that for an English language instructional tool, is teaching with fairy tales. Um, and so I, it was interesting because we had a bunch of fairy tales from uh, Mexico that were in English, and a lot of them I grew up with and I was very familiar with. And these were not your typical goblins, and but they were definitely um, from my culture, like the the scary creatures we had. So just like Paula was saying, they had their own boogeyman that's in Louisiana. Um, you know, we have different ones here as well, different creatures. Um, and so why teach with fairy tales? Well, because everyone has grown up with them, especially that we live in a very, very diverse, um, we have very diverse classrooms. Now your classroom doesn't look like it used to. Uh, before, when I used to teach in other countries, sometimes I would come, um, I would have my classes, and I, I've taught a lot of English language learners. Now I teach English 1301. Um, I also teach English language learners in college, um, but I also teach um, native speakers. And it's interesting because um, that's not true anymore. Even in my English 1301 class with college freshmen, I still have students who are English is not the first language. Um, I have very diverse classrooms from all over the world, and it, it's always a Surprising to me now, you know, because they just come, and it's not just from one country. Usually in San Antonio, that's where I teach. Um, it used to be a lot of students from Mexico, but I have some from Korea this year. I have some from Africa. I have some from, and these are just college students that have come to the college. Uh, it's a community college, so it's not an international college, and it, it's just very um, a great way because it, it's one of those um, teaching tools that's cross-cultural because they can share part of their culture and history as well. And because if you do have any that are language learners, it's a familiar structure to them. So they understand um, the plot. They understand how the basic, you know, fairy tales, they understand you always start off with once upon a time and you always end with <laughs> happily ever after. Well, usually end with happily ever after. And so they understand um that structure, and that makes it easier for literacy, and it makes it easier for writing as well. They're going to write their own. They're familiar with many of the same characters, something like, for example, Little Red Riding Hood. Um, it, it's very easy for them to remember because they were told this for such a long time, and that one's pretty cross-cultural. They do spark imagination, so if you do have your students um, read uh, I mean, write their own versions. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Then it it inspires them to not only think of, you know, magical elements, enchanted, you know, these wonderful, beautiful kingdoms that could be made in different ways. And that's interesting itself because if you're um, in Europe, that castle is going to look very different than one that's going to be, for example, in the Middle East or in Asia. So even the structural elements themselves will tell you a lot about the culture and uh, also the region, the geography of it. Um, and then there's also that it's very familiar. So um, even if you're teaching adults, if you're teaching teenagers, if you're teaching children, they're all familiar with the structure. So it is definitely across um, ages as well. So I will go into a little bit of research about fairy tales that you may have not known, but I studied when I was in uh, college. And so I found it very fascinating and thought it would be really great to share with you so you have some background, but also because of um, students as well. Now, a lot of times fairy tales are very motivating because students have seen the version in Disney. And what I like now about Disney is that a lot of the fairy tales 
um, do happen to be Okay, and these are great questions in the chat box. Um, is there a difference between fairy tales and folk tales? Yes, there is. And so we're going to go for the structure in a little bit. But folk tales, um, so folk tale can sometimes be a fairy tale as well. Um, but the folk tale is more, you're going to see more of the, the myths and stuff as well. Um, and the reason why they call them folk tales is because those are more regional. Um, like, for example, La Llorona. That's considered a folk tale, but it's also Mexican fairy tale or Latino fairy tale. I won't just say Mexico because I think it's in other countries as well. Um, when kids arrive, and it doesn't always have, uh, folk tales don't always have happily ever at endings. Um, so that's the difference between it, too. Um, but uh, Vladimir Prop, who really, really studied this, he's the first one, um, kind of combines them together, uh, both folk tales and fairy tales. Um, when kids write their own fairy tales, do they tend to make them scary like the traditional fairy tales? Actually, no. <laughs> it, it's a very, it, it's, and that's funny because students have a sometimes have a very difficult time writing horror. Horror is a little bit or scary elements are are much harder for students I find to write than uh, fairies and dragons and I mean <laughs> I don't really consider dragons too scary. Uh, but but students, yeah, they definitely. Um, I think struggle a little bit more with that, that even though they like watching scary movies. Uh, so it's it's interesting. Um, I, but yeah, I definitely, I mean, they, they tend to stick with the same characters that they've seen in, um, in the movies. Um, so I think that's, um, you know, Disney has a large role to play with that. So Vladimir Aprop um, uh, says these are the major characters that you'll find in a lot of fairy tales. Um, also, there's, oh, and that's a good point. So Paula says that her boys tend to be more blood and guts. I think also it depends on the teacher. So if you are, you know, you support and, and you're open to and you don't get scared off, for me it's a little bit easier because now I teach college uh, freshmen and anything goes there. I mean, I don't have to really edit them too much, but um, when they're younger, you may have to, you know, if they get a little too um, too too out there. <laughs> um, and that's up to you. That's completely up to you, but that might also inspire them to get a little bit more creative if we're not so... Um, Oh, wow, that's in there. <laughs> um, but there's usually a hero. There's a protagonist, and I don't think that the hero is necessarily the protagonist. So I don't, he doesn't necessarily um, separate those two, but I separate those. And the protagonist is an English word. It just means the major character that is represented as the good character. There's always a villain or a protagonist. That's another way to call it. Um, a helper, a dispatcher, and a donor. A helper, um, so how many of you are familiar with the fairy tale? And I really love this, that Disney now is getting new fairy tales. Um, um, and, and, and it may not, and there's other, um, animated, you know, movies out there, and they're getting different ones. And now they're even, uh, showing, uh, different types of cultures. So I think that's very, very important. But if you've seen a Shrek, then you may know the answer to this question, which is, uh, who is the helper for Shrek? So that kind of helps you with knowing this role of the helper. It's someone that's usually on the journey with the main, um, either the hero or protagonist. They go, they go on the journey. And sometimes there's more than one helper. Um, so who in Shrek is, yes, exactly, Eddie Murphy, the donkey. So you can identify a lot of these uh, different the helpers. And, in, in, um, for example, who is the helper for uh, uh, for Snow White? Who are her, her helpers? In that case, she has helpers. The, yes, exactly. She gets seven dwarves. That's that's very nice. <laughs> so you can see these roles when you start looking at different fairy tales, and that I think that's 
pretty exciting for kids. Um, and just to see that the structures are very, very similar, um, especially for older. Teenagers really like looking at the different elements. Um, there's usually, I don't always see the false hero. Um, this is, I believe, in much longer fairy tales. A false hero can be there. And that's someone that acts like the hero. And, some, and that false hero, it, uh, but later on people realize that that person is not really a hero or the hero. And, um, and this usually comes about in much longer fairy tale, I think. Um, and the false hero is different than the villain, but this is what Vladimir Prop found. Um, there's a dispatcher and a, do a donor. A dispatcher is usually someone that um, sends the the hero out. Um, and so you'll notice in a lot of the fairy tales that there's always someone that's leaving the house, leaving their comfort zone, and they're going into territory they're unfamiliar with. It's going to be scary, and something bad is going to happen to them, but they're going to get through it and they're going to eventually live happily ever after. So the dispatcher is someone who sends. So if we think of, for example, Jack and the Beanstalk. Okay, so Jack is sent away, and he's given beans. So there's the dispatcher there sending him away. I believe it was to his, his mother or father. It's usually a parental figure. Um, but someone sends them, and then usually, um, you know, gives a donor is there to give them, you know, advice, to help them along the way. Um, it's different than the helper because the donor is more like a Yoda. It's more like a, a mentor figure there. And what's really interesting is you can see a lot of these elements if you look at the typical hero story. So even um, when you think of things like um, Star Wars, you can see a lot of these characters as well. So according to Vladimir Prop, a fairy tale usually includes 31 steps, okay? But I believe that um, there's actually, uh, I'm just going to share the ones I think. I'm not going to share with you all 31, the ones that I um, have seen within this, and you can always look at more. So it begins, uh, the heroes leave home, Hansel and Gretel, and even though it's Hansel and Gretel, they have to leave home. Um, you see Little Red Riding Hood, she leave, live, uh, leaves the house. I mean, so all of these are leaving home. So, yes, that is definitely an element. Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, they usually take place in a forest. Um, you, that tends to be a very common element since they wanted to protect children. Or scary areas. So you think of even La Yona and La Llorona, um, you, the the original one does have it where it's inside the um, forest. Um, and Paul was talking about the boogeyman, and he was in the um, swamp. So that's still their type of danger area, okay? The herald is told not to do something or not to go somewhere, and they do it anyway, okay? So the hero, that's something really great, and teenagers and adolescents love this a lot, is that the hero or the protagonist in the fairy tale is a bit rebellious, just like them, <laughs> and um, does, so it's great because it's a, it's a great way to show them um, when they do do something that they're not supposed to, and they're probably going to do that because they are their age, um, then something will go wrong. It will be very scary. They'll meet a villain, okay, the, <laughs> because there are villains in the world, you know, or what, and, and that can be kind of controversial as well. So a lot of people, um, especially researchers, Lyris, um, and they, they, they definitely critique that in fairy tales, which is this deepness between good and evil. So the hero is good, the villain is evil, and they make the villain very, very evil. There's no siding with the villain, okay? Um, but the one thing about the villain, and if your students do create the villain, um, you know, when they do create their own villains, which is a little bit harder, they should remember that the villain is extremely smart in a fairy tale. And so remember, the parents were trying to get their students to, um, parents were trying to get students, I mean, uh, their children to 
prepare them for this world um, where they may come into all the, these different dangers and they wanted them to be smart about it. So fairy tales help with that instead of saying, hey, you might meet a stranger. Don't talk to strangers. The stranger is going to try and trick you, give you candy, um, you know, something very scary. And so it was so in these fairy tales, the villain is very smart, very cunning, very sly, very wise. And so um, they are so smart that even though, and, and if you look at villains in fairy tales, who's the villain in uh, Little Red Riding Hood? It's a big, scary wolf. If you look at um, a lot of um, you know, even the evil stepmom and Snow White, these are not, these. they look like villains. That's the interesting part of a fairy tale is they look like villains. They're very, very scary. But even though they look like a, some, you know, some creature that's very scary or some person, like a witch that's very scary, they are so smart, they still are able to trick the hero. So that's, um, that's, I, I like to share that with my students so that they understand that they just don't make this a villain um, and associate evil with not being smart. That sometimes, you know, um, that they're, you know, it, it, it's very intelligent. Things can fold them in the world, um, and that they can that can be bad. You know um, that they have to look deeper into issues and uh, what they believe in. So I think that's in, very important. So the villain usually harms someone or harms a property, um, and then a hero discovers mid fortune. Um, he tries to help someone usually. Um, here's more. The hero is tested, helped, or attacked. Usually tested in some way. They're also helped. Um, they pass the test, and this can be the protagonist as well, solve problems. And then, you know, for Little Red Riding Hood, she has to go through the forest. She meets this evil wolf. He tricks her or tries to trick her. Um, you know, she has a basket. She's performing this service to get, you know, goods to her grandmother. Um, often there's magic, and the hero obtains magic. Jack and the Beanstalk, it was some beans that were magical beans. And so there's a lot of um, magical elements. Cinderella, there was a fairy tale godmother, and she becomes, a, um, um, you know, made into a princess to go to a ball uh, with these glass slippers. So you can see a lot of the, you know, students can identify, okay, where is the magic? You know, what is the magical element? What are the, pa the tests the hero has to pass? Um, how is the hero um, helped? Heroes reach a treasure. The hero and villain have an uh, encounter. It's not necessarily a fight, um, but definitely we can see that with Little Red Riding Hood, her and the wolf, you know, when she finds out the grammar, the gram that that is not the grandmother, um, then they, you know, fight. Um, the villain is defeated. Um, that's a, so the hero always wins. The protagonist always defeats the evil, uh, which is very important for families, you know, wanting to to um, share with their their children, you know, uh, for them to prepare them for the world, that if they just, you know, go through all of this and they're able to do this. Um, and then the problem is fortune resolved. The hero heads home and lives happily ever after. Sometimes the home is changed. If you want to get students familiar with the structure because they want to write their own fairy tales, these are some really great graphic organizers to do that. I like this one, especially for adolescents, young children, because it's in the shape of a fairy tale, so it looks really, really nice. It's a free handout from education.com, or they can draw their own castle. Sometimes with graphic organizers, I have them if they're on a tablet, and they just do this with a stylus pen and use a uh, uh, drawing type of um, software like I use edu creations we just don't record the video so uh, or um, there's a lot of ones out there you can use paper 53 Adobe Illustrator I mean there's tons and tons um, and TP Harrell who is inside um, the chat uh, who's here with us she's um, here she created this one for her students, they actually did this um, 
class global collaboration project where they shared fairy tales um, that they wrote for students with um, ones in Italy. So I believe it was Italy, um, NTP. And so that's really great. Um, <laughs> there are uh, different story elements um, that are very, very familiar with the uh, a fairy tale. So they can have the setting with the plot, the characters, beginning, middle, and end, and that's definitely part of the structure of a fairy tale. Read, write, think, which all teachers, I think, um, should know about because it's brilliant, it's wonderful, it has a lot of interactive lesson plans for teachers, and these are good lesson plans. These are just not um, fairy tale lesson plans uh, or lesson plans that don't have some kind of, uh, they walk them through the process, especially if you write, um, uh, are a teacher that teaches writing in some form, even if you teach scientific writing, it has a tons of graphic organizers and walk in interactive where walk students through the process of that. So some of the elements that they actually have are the, here we have the conflict, white, occurs and how it could be resolved. And when students are writing a fairy tale, it's it's difficult for them um, because to come up with these. So I think a graphic organizer focusing on the conflict itself, um, where they're imagining, okay, so first they think of the hero, they think of the the villain, and then they have to think of, okay, what is this conflict that's going to occur? What you know, when the hero leaves or the protagonist leaves the house, what are they going to encounter? And they can do something like a modern fairy tale. I think that's, and the great thing about um, if they do do a modern fairy tale, then they can talk about the very present issue of bullying. So you can even tie it to a citizenship bullying lesson where students, you know, really explore bullying in their fairy tales, their modern fairy tales. Uh, so what is the conflict? Well, what's going to happen? You know, what is this protagonist going to face in the real world, maybe on the digital world, um, that's going to be very scary and very real kind of scary um, for them that they should. So it could even be digital safety awareness. Uh, why does it occur? Well, you know, it could be something like um, the hero uh, ends up putting information or a picture online, um, and that's why, you know, this conflict occurs or something like that, and then gets bullied, you know. I saw a girl with no hands, so maybe it's something like that. The the villain, I don't know. <laughs> oh, there's a the girl. Okay, this is an actual, oh, the grim fairy tale. Okay. <laughs> um, and then how is it resolved? What happens? How is, you know, all of this? So there are definite elements found in fairy tales. Um, there's, it always starts with once upon a time. That's one children are very familiar with. So that can be filled out really, really easily. Um, there are fantasy and make-believe elements. So students can get as imaginative and, as they want. They can, you know, let their imaginations run wild, be very creative. And when they are um, making fairy tales, I think that, Sometimes it's really great to get them to either get pictures, um, to make a setting, or to draw. Um, so my students, even in college, they draw a lot when they do their writing. Um, and I think that's really important because it, nowadays um, drawing and, or taking pictures really helps students inspire them to, you know, um, to be creative, they can look at the, you can actually show uh, different types of images from printed fairy tales, and they can, uh, or even screenshots if you're more into video, you can you can show different um, video clips from different types of fairy tales as well. And actually, um, Antipi, um, and she's in the chat box, uh, shared a really great tool for sharing um, video clips from YouTube, just like tiny clips. And I think it's called ReClip, but MPP, if you remember that tool, you can share that. That would be great. Um, and so you can also have them imagine, you know, what kind of um, enchanted setting. What does the castle look like? What does this, you know, village look like? They can imagine, you know, what this, a grand, grand mas uh, mansion looks like uh, or castle. Um, there's a lot of patterns and numbers, so you can also even show math um, with fairy tales because there are usually you see a lot of times like um, where you look at you know Alibaba and there are seven is one of them, three 
Um, sometimes you have to repeat something three times. Uh, Cinderella, she has to repeat, I believe, you know, um, three times comes in that too. Rumpelstiltskin, there's definitely, you know, he knocks so many times. So looking at the number patterns, looking at which numbers are important in fairy tales, um, that could be really important as well. So you can teach math there. You can teach geography as well because a lot of these have different uh, kind of areas and things like that. Um, there's a problem or conflict. There's definitely a climax, a resolution, or the literary term for that is denouement, if you're an English teacher. <laughs> um, and then there's the happily ever after. Not necessarily. It depends on your type of um, country and culture. There's a universal or many different types of universal lessons um, about fairy tales, and that's because of that, the reasoning of why they were, they came about. It was a way for children to learn important lessons. Um, it was a, you know, it's really important for parents because parents understood early on that when their children were adults and were going to leave the household, they were going to be on their own. And also because, um, they knew, like most parents know, if you tell your child something, don't do this, don't talk to strangers, um, your child's not going to necessarily listen. But if they have a fairy tale and they see that, you know, it could turn into a whoop and um, eat their grandmother or something like that, you know, very, very scary, then that actually makes more of an impression. So uh, fairy tales, that's why it's really important um, you know, that uh, students look at the universal themes too because it's trying to teach them a universal lesson as well. Um, so there's a, one of the the resources is by Chalkbox, and it has them actually do that. It has them go through all of these elements and to check them off in different fairy tales. Now, they use the one called Little Red Cap, but you can have students um, search through different types. Of, they can look at that database that I shared at the beginning of fairy tales around the world. They choose one, and then they actually fill this chart out for themselves um, for that particular fairy tale. So they can research different fairy tales, and they can even present on those as well. Um, common motifs, or you can have them break up in um, groups of four, and then they can exchange, you know, information about their fairy tales. So they teach each other about the fairy tales that they've researched from around the world. There are common motifs, or motifs are themes. So what are the themes? Well, or, or uh, things that you see that are very common in these. And so you see, for example, there's um, usually a quest or some kind of journey. There are talking animals and objects. And so this is, uh, you know, there's spoons and things that talk in Beauty and the Beast. I mean, so, yes, definitely, there's different types of um, talking animals or objects. Monsters, there's definitely, and monsters, what they mean by this, this can also be trolls, this can be dwarves, like Rumpelstiltskin, um, this can be, I mean, dragons, um, there's all kinds of different types of monsters. Uh, there's always the trickster, which is usually the villain, but someone that's very cunning and sly. In Aesop's Fables, it's usually a fox. <laughs> but in fairy tales, it can be, um, you know, different types of uh, tricksters. And, you know, um, you know, there's different ways that there's going to be a trickster. A uh, ruffle still skin tries to trick, you know, um, as well. So, I mean, um, there's Rapunzel. Um, um, there's in, in, most of the, I mean, in all the fairy tales you look at, you're going to see where there's that kind of word games and trickster. The poor wins. And that's uh, something that's really important that we tend to overlook in fairy tales. So not only were fairy tales a great way to be able to, um, for parents to tell children about the world, but they was also for them to realize the world they live in. Um, because back before, you know, and, and societies have advanced a lot, but in a lot of places still, there's a huge disparity between um, the rich and the poor. So in, in fairy tales, you can see this. Um, you know, there, Cinderella, she's tethered. She um, is cleaning the house every day. Her life is very different. She works very, very, very hard work. And then 
at the end, the happily ever after is that she's all of a sudden um, her her house grows a billion times bigger. She has a you know much 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 more money than she had, and she uh, is no longer cleaning every day. And so this is a big reality for a lot of families. Is you know some of them were very very poor, and then uh, back. Uh, you know, what you were served or anything like that. And, and there you lived and you saw this very, uh, you know, rich uh, kingdom and, and all this money. So fairy tales came from that kind of uh, societal, uh, those societal concerns as well. You see human weaknesses, uh, you know, Snow White eats an apple, human strengths as well. And there's usually impossible task, something that, you know, the hero thinks, wow, how am I ever going to do this? Uh, Jack and the Beanstalk, you know, he has to deliver these beans. <laughs> that becomes very difficult for him. There's usually magic words and phrases, um, you know, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let your hair down, or, um, ab you know, um, bippity boppity boo. Um, there is a ton of magic words and phrases. Uh, good versus evil. Young versus old, so the because families are trying to be wise and try to help their children. So yeah, there's definitely um, these young and old um, versus old. Sleep is a common uh, you know motif in a lot of fairy tales. <laughs> we see Sleeping Beauty. I mean, uh, Snow White even gets you know. So there's a lot of sleep. Uh, which is good. <laughs> there are usually some kind of path or a key, and then there's gluttony versus starvation, which is still going through those, uh, you know, a reflection of society. So one of the easiest ways, instead of uh, getting students to write their own modern fairy tales, although that can be definitely something, um, is that they can also why the fractured fairy tale. And this is usually what I tend to get my students to do. So what we do is, yes, we can modernize some of the setting, the elements, but what they really do is that they take one character and they tell uh, the story, the fairy tale from that point of view. Um, and they have to change one of the other elements, you know, and make it modern as well. So that's usually what it gets to do. To they love it. We usually start off by reading, um, we we start off by reading uh, the Three Little Pigs by the Wolf or <laughs> Little Red Riding Hood according to the Wolf. So there's definitely a lot of um, uh, ways that you know students can tell from a different point of view, and that's very fun for them. And they get to um, change that element that a, a lot of um, analysts um, critique about fairy tales, which is that you know there's no just complete you know, villain, um, and, and so it gets students to kind of empathize and be in villain shoes, or they can tell it, you know, sometimes uh, from, you know, this, the, this, the woodsman's point of view or the gravel's point of view, so there's a lot of fun ways that they can really, and you can take any kind of fairy tale, not just, you know, Little Red Riding Hood, they can just take the fairy tale even that they researched and that they studied and then rewrite it uh, from their point of view. Um, and that way they don't have to because for a lot of times if they are coming up with a fairy tale, that takes a lot longer than writing a fractured fairy tale. For a fractured fairy tale, they're only changing a few elements. If they come up with their own fairy tale, then that um, takes a lot more time. A fairy tale apps, and then we'll wrap up. Um, there's a lot by iOS, uh, you know, and I, uh, and these are the ones that, I, there are some other ones that I think are really great, but a lot of them don't work with the new updates. So, fairy tale story makers, a good one, uh, students can record their own voice, they actually see little characters, even from fables as well, you see the wolf there, um, and then they can um, move them, and sometimes they move on their own, and then they record their own voice. So it makes it a little bit easier to write a fractured fairy tale or to tell from a different point of view if you just want a quick lesson. A lot of these are uh, geared towards adolescents and children, by the way. Uh, Toka Taylor fairy tales, uh, really, really fun. Uh, they get to actually dress different types of, uh, you know, fairy tale characters. It gets to look at the different creatures that are there. Wonderland free fairy tale game, uh, that's actually a 
modified, what is it called? Um, it does so, so much, but they actually get to have a uh, look at some magical creatures. They learn how those creatures uh, live, fairy tale lives, and they get to interact with them. It's uh, A lot of this is a game, so they get to, you know, uh, play a lot and uh, do things for that character. Um, and the character will direct them to do things as well. And then one of the really cool elements that I like a lot is that um, – they actually get to make funny pictures with these characters. So that's really cool, a little bit of like augmented reality and uh, they can put that character there. Um, I would like this app. I think the Wonderland for Retail is a good app. They, uh, you know, that was asked, uh, for, you know, what is a good app for a second. I think that one is a really good one as well in that fairy tale maker. Princess fairy tale maker. Um, I don't like the name of it. Because it's not only for, and DuckDuck News is an incredible company. They make shadow picks. So this one's even really good for second as well. But this one I wish wasn't called Princess Fairy Tailmaker because it's, it makes it kind of where it's not for boys. But it does have a lot of things for the boys. So the boys might be a little sh um, shy with this. But they can choose from 32 animated scenes. And so they select the fairy tale scene and then they can um, create their own fairy tales with stickers. And so and I know the boys might be um, not like the name of it, but actually it's a great way for them to um, tell, um, you know, their own fairy tales. This one is really great, too, because it has the uh, princesses who do uh, things that are not just like a princess, and that's something that's definitely uh, criticized as well. So the princesses here are astronauts and do really cool things. You can have them just um, draw their own characters or just create the characters with another kind of um, you know, Photoshop or anything they want. Um, and when they upload them, they, um, or they can, they can put these in books. And so some of the books um, that do allow you to do that is Book Creator. Book Creator is really, really great for that. Little Bird Tells allows you to draw your own characters as well. A Story Kit, you can add pictures, drawings, anything like that. Story Kit is actually a, an app. Um, Toon Do, Story Jumper, and My Storybook do not allow that. They have their own kind of character sets and stuff, so um, students can use characters from there. And that's it. So I'm going to go ahead and end there, and then we're going to go ahead and um, answer any questions that I might have not gone into. But before we go, I want to let you know that there is a free open online course um, for teachers all over the world. You get badges um, backed by the Ministry of Education in Spain. Um, me, uh, I, I mean, uh, Fabiana Costello from Argentina, and then um, my partner, Kelly Jake Duncan, are all running this, and it's a, called the Gold Boy Good Teacher. You can uh, sign up for free here. You can do any of the, it's only uh, four hours a week, but, you know, of course, you can make that a lot less. And so just wanted to let you know about that. And I will share with you, um, and I'll put the link to that, but here's the, um, these are some of the references that I've used for this particular presentation. If you want to go learn more, uh, Peggy has shared it inside the chat box. And any questions you have, I can answer on different social networks, or you can ask me right now. So thank you so much for listening and contributing and your wonderful questions and also adding some different fairy tales I didn't even know about. So um, that thank you so much for that. Thanks, Shelley. Uh, I think everybody learned a lot from your presentation today. There was only one question that you didn't ask as we went along, and that was, is there always just one hero in a fairy tale? That's very interesting, yes. But there's the helper. So sometimes the helper can be seen as a very, uh, you know, as a little bit of a hero. But there's mm -hmm. the the main character is the hero. So, uh, for example, Shrek and Donkey can sometimes look a little bit like a hero. Um, but now with the new modern fairy tales, Puss and Boots, things like that, those um, you'll notice that those characters end up getting another fairy tale of their own or, you know, they come out with their own, uh, where they get to be the hero and shine in their own plot. But usually, yes. 
Oh, that's so cool. Peggy, that is a very good question. Um, the question is, are there any rat fairy cows? No, I've never been asked that question, but I don't see why that couldn't be something that would be um, very cool to be able to um, to be able to um, you know have students have where there's a wrap in it. I think that would be really fun. Um, I just googled it and it did a, there. I did find so this might be interesting for teens or adolescents. I haven't seen it yet, but apparently there are uh, fairy tales and one features Chance the Rapper, so that might be. <laughs> I guess they're doing. That could be interesting. <laughs> um, I put a link to Pixabay. That's where I get my images. They're free stock images. I would have students use that for free stock images only for because some of the um, the the pictures are it's not filtered. So, uh, but that's where I get my uh, slides from. I mean the, the, the images for my slides. Does Savvy have a favorite fairy tale right now? Um, so Savvy has favorite characters right now, mm -hmm. but she doesn't okay. have uh, a fair. Uh, she doesn't quite yet because she's one. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe when she's two, two, she will. But we're going to try and introduce her to. You. And that's really a great thing. Is is uh, now you can see things where the the females are are much stronger uh, mm -hmm. characters. So you know we show her. Uh, Moana and <laughs> much stronger. You don't want to show her Mulan um, and, and different uh, strong female characters. <laughs> well, those were the questions that I was able to capture. Does anyone else have a question for Shelley? You can type in the chat. And you can see both my children. I know that was a question at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, here's Banana, and here's Roscoe the Pug. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. And I love having you all in, too. You always um, share very interesting um, uh, tidbits there. So I think that's. Um, I didn't know about this swamp creature in Louisiana, so I, that even goes more like showing, you know, about the, um, that goes to show, you know, the different cultural and uh, location, um, how that uh, location can really impact uh, the fairy tale as well. Again, thanks so much for presenting today, Shelley. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will tell us what's coming up next. Okay, thank you all so much. I, I love being here, and you can always uh, reach me on Twitter or Facebook. Thank you so much, Shelley. This was just fascinating. And we have some great shows coming up, so I hope you'll all come back every Saturday, same time. Next week, we're going to have a um, great show on Book Creator in the Classroom. And John Smith is a fantastic ambassador for um, Book Creator, and this will be a great extension to what Shelley started today. On March 3rd, Heather Moser is going to join us, and she's going to be talking about ways to enhance relationships through modern technology tools. And March 10th, Jolie Boucher, Boucher um, differentiating instruction with HyperDocs. We've had some shows on the HyperDocs, and I know that this is going to be so great to get some new ideas and ways that we can use them. And March 24th, Paula Fellinger is going to be our featured teacher, and she's a second grade teacher. So come back whenever you can. And if you can't join us live, be sure to check out the recordings. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar, where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate session. And as long as it's open to the public, it is free. You can nominate a featured teacher here. 
by filling out this form. It's also in the live binder as well as the chat. You can nominate yourself as a featured teacher for the month as well. The video collections on iTunes U, so you can see recordings there. As you exit the session, the survey link should open in your browser. You can take the survey link from the chat or the chat log or from within the live binder. At the end of the survey, you can request a professional development certificate, and it now prints with your name. Thanks to Patty Ruffing, who also sends them out. Please, though, make sure this is a personal email address if you do request a certificate rather than a school email address. Schools tend to block these from getting to you. Special thanks again to our special guest, Shelley Terrell, Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming.